to turn with me to Philippians chapter 3. We continue our series there. So our text was supposed to be verses 20, 21, and then chapter 4, verse 1, but as you're getting to know me, I didn't get through all of it. Uh, So we will look at verse 1, chapter 4, verse 1 uh, next week, uh, the Lord willing. We will read here now, though, starting in chapter 3, verse 12, and then read through to 4, verse 1. Philippians 3, verse 12, this is God's word. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, Their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame, with their minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord my beloved. So far, God's word. Brothers and sisters of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, how at home How comfortable are you in this world that we live? Do you, to quote the words of a song, do you love the flowers and trees and the smell of the grinding seas and all the beautiful things in this life so much as to forget that this, this is not our final home? This is, we can even say, not where we belong. We should not fit in in this world. Well, this is what Paul, this is what God's Word, this is what the Holy Spirit is seeking to impress upon our hearts this morning. We do not belong here. We are foreigners. We are strangers. I summarize God's Word with the theme there, Our citizenship is in heaven. We'll look at that first point, awaiting citizens. Now, the the second word in our text uh, is our in the English, but in in the Greek, it's the first word. Now, maybe that doesn't matter too much to us. We can often use our uh, at the beginning of a sentence, but that's unusual in Greek. And so by putting, putting that word first uh, in, in the sentence, that word our, but our citizenship is in Greek, uh, is in heaven, uh, it says there in, in the Greek, our citizenship is in heaven. By putting that our right at the front, Paul is drawing attention to it, and he is making a, a clear distinction for us there from the enemies of the cross of Christ, the ones that he has just been describing in the verses 18 and 19. 
And so there is a, a clear us versus them mentality going on in, a, in our text. And for good reason, perhaps you recall from a couple of weeks ago, these, these enemies of the cross of Christ, they, they have their minds set on earthly things, on sinful things. They glory in what they ought to be ashamed of. Nothing is off limits for them. Their God is their belly, which is to say every sin you can imagine, every desire you can have. None of them are off base. None of them are off limits, no matter how sick and twisted and godless they might be. And such people are not on the narrow road that leads to life, but on the wide road that leads to destruction. And no wonder then Paul makes a a clear, solid line, a strong distinction between us and them. We, Paul says, we are not like them. We are not like these these enemies of the cross of Christ. We are different. But how? How exactly are we different from them? Well, for the enemies of the cross of Christ, we can say that everything for them is, is horizontal. That is their earthly mindset. This world, the one we live in now, it is all that they know. It is all that they care about, all that they live for. This is their home. This is where their citizenship is. But we are different. We do not deny the horizontal. We live in this world. We raise our kids in this world. We work here. And we do so with joy. This this is our Father's world. And yet we are different. Different in that we are deeply aware that the horizontal is not all there is. There is a vertical dimension to life as well. There is a place out there that makes this place we call planet Earth pale in comparison to what we have here. And that makes this world strange and foreign to us. That leaves us with with a sense and even a, a, a reality that we don't actually belong in this place, this place, this, this world, you know, it's, it's filled with the enemies of, of the cross of Christ, for one. It is filled with sin. It is filled with sorrow. It is filled with all manner of struggles. We know this. There's something wrong with the world. And so, knowing this, we, we feel like foreigners. Strangers in a land not our own, who don't belong here, not in this world's current state. And and this ought to leave us desiring what Hebrews 11, what we read there in Hebrews 11, verse 15, what it calls a better country that is a heavenly one. And and for the Christian, this better country, this heavenly place, it's it's not out of reach. It's not pie in the sky, idealism. What, What does verse 20 say? It doesn't say we, 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 should, we should have a citizenship in heaven. No, our citizenship, it says there in, if I can find it, in verse 20. But our citizenship is in heaven. This is a reality. We are citizens of a better country. Our passports come from a heavenly city, you could say, from the new Jerusalem, as it is called in Revelation 21. And these passports, they they were issued by the Lord himself. And they all say, this one was born within the walls of Zion. And this is the joy of every Christian, of every child of God. You might recall when we looked at Philippians 1, verse 27, how apt this citizen language is for the Philippians. They were called there in chapter 1, verse 27, to behave as citizens worthy of the gospel of Christ. And you remember perhaps that that Philippi was a Roman colony. It was a miniature Rome. And they, of all people, knew what it was like to have passports in a far-off city. Most, many, if not most of the Philippians and the Philippian believers in specific had, had never even been to Rome. Google Maps says it's 1,300 kilometers away. They didn't have cars in those days. 
And most people would have had to travel by foot and then also jump on a ship to get there. And yet, even though many of them had not been there, they were proud, those Philippians were, of their far-off citizenship in Rome. Rome was their home, the Philippians would say. And they showed it too. Remember, they dressed like Romans. They talked like Romans. They took Roman names. And here Paul is saying, may it be so and even more with the heavenly city to which you belong. As proud as you might be, Philippians, of being Roman citizens, be prouder still and infinitely more so that you have a passport from heaven. And as it is with them, so it must be with us. You may not be as proud of this royal city we live in that we call Guelph, or proud to be a Canadian, I assume most of you are. This is not our home. Even if you have a passport from here or some other country, your citizenship is not here. It is in heaven. That is your home. That is where we belong, not here. Not here. And may this this vertical reality shape the way we live horizontally. You know, know, sometimes we forget this. Sometimes we are in danger of forgetting the vertical. We believe the lie that our culture so often says. You only have one life to live, right? And And it's here in this fallen world. No, it's not. We can be tempted as well than if we believe this lie to to squeeze in every possible thing that this world has to offer. We, We don't want to miss out. We don't want our kids to miss out on anything. And so we we don't want to miss out either. And so so we we travel the world. We do everything that we can to enjoy this life, thinking that this is the only life we have to live. I've been talking to some of you, and I know some of you have gone on holidays. Some of you are looking forward to spring break. I'm not saying that it's wrong to travel, that it's wrong to enjoy a time off. But we need to remember, and this is what Paul is saying and reminding us of, that, that we, we should not just travel this world as tourists. We are not tourists here. We don't live for this life. This isn't all that there is. It is okay if our kids miss out on things here in this life. It is okay to not go on a trip for the sake of the work of the gospel and the kingdom. We belong to a better country, far better, in fact, than this one. Along with the faithful in Hebrews 11, may we have the eyes of faith to see, to acknowledge, indeed, that we're not tourists, but we are strangers and exiles on this earth, seeking a homeland, desiring that better country, that heavenly one, prepared and designed by God Himself. And if this is so, if strangers and exiles is what we actually are, well, then we we shouldn't be surprised either or caught off guard when we feel strange in this world. In fact, it ought to concern us if we don't feel strange and out of place in this world. Young people, when you live in faithfulness to God, when you realize that this is not your home, you will feel out of place among people who think that this is all there is to life you will have a sense that you do not belong in this broken and sinful world because you don't. Remember your passport. It is in heaven. Your citizenship is there. And so so it is with with all who, who belong to Jesus Christ by faith. But you might think, well, what makes our citizenship in heaven pale in comparison to our citizenship in here on earth? I've never been to heaven. I don't know what it's what it's like. Why do we belong here and not there? Well, lots of reasons. You you, you don't belong, for one, because here we have the enemies of the cross of Christ all around us. 
You don't belong in this world as well that is marred with with sin and brokenness. Not just out there, but also in our own hearts as well. But the most important reason why we don't belong here is because there's someone that we are closest to that is not here. Jesus. Jesus is why. The Lord Jesus Christ makes our citizenship in heaven better. He's why we belong there and not in this fallen world. He he is the, the head and we are the body, Scripture says, and heads and bodies belong together. He bought us with His precious blood, redeemed us body and soul, set us free from that horizontal way of life that ends in destruction, claimed us as His own, were His prized possession. And He, above all, is why we can never really be at home in this fallen world. If someone you you love is far away from you, especially if it is a beloved spouse, you, you long to be where they are, don't you? Home is where your heart is, and your heart is with the one that you love. So without your loved one, something is missing. Life is strange, it's foreign, you you feel like an exile. Well, so it is with the Lord, with the Lord Jesus Christ. How how can we ever feel at home in this life when, when Jesus, the church's bridegroom, the one who is our life, who is our joy, who is our ever great reward, is is not with us physically. We we cannot see him face to face. Something is missing. Life is strange without Him. And that is how it should be. That is how it must be for us as Christians. And so that's who Paul, that's who the Philippians, that's who we are, are, are awaiting. That's what Paul goes on to say in verse 20, does he not? But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we, we await a Savior. We await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Await is a special word for Paul. It expresses an eagerness, an expectant uh, joy. And in, in the six times that Paul uses the word, every time he uses it in the New Testament, it refers to the Christian's persistent yearning and eager desire for Jesus to come back. Now, that's different from Philippians 1, verses 21 to 23. Maybe you remember that passage. Paul expressed there his desire to depart and be with Christ, and that he said, remember the the grammar that he had, that was much more better. But, But here, here we are not eagerly waiting to depart and be with Christ in heaven. That's what we might think, but no, we are eagerly waiting for our Savior to come to us. From from it, from heaven, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes we fall into the trap of focusing on what will happen to us right after we die. We forget that being with Christ immediately after we die, wonderful as that is, what what a blessing to be with Christ immediately after we die. But we must not forget that that is not the best part. It is much more better than being in this fallen and broken world, to be sure. But what is much more better than being in heaven with Jesus is being with Jesus here on earth when he returns in glory with our physical bodies. When we die, our souls go to be with Christ immediately. Our bodies don't. They go down to the grave, as you well know. They decay. They return to dust. But the Lord Jesus Christ didn't come just to redeem our souls. If so, he'd only be a half-savior. And a half-savior is no savior at all. As savior, Jesus came to save us. Every part of us, not just our souls, but our our bodies too. And so until Jesus comes back, a part of us, you could say, 
if we can say it this way, is, is not with Jesus. Our, our bodies are not with him. They lie in the grave. But it, it won't be so forever, will it? That's because of what the Lord Jesus Christ will do as our Savior when he comes again with glory. And, and, and what does he do? Well, that's described in verse 21. From it we await the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like His glorious body. Now notice that Paul doesn't shift the attention or the focus back to the enemies of the cross of Christ here, as if they are all the cause of our struggles and pain. It is true that Christians at various times and places do suffer immensely at the hands of the enemies of the cross of Christ. But we need more than Jesus to, to come as, as judge and, and to deal with those wicked sinners over there. We need Jesus also to come as a Savior, as our Savior, to redeem us. The world is not just broken because of the people out there. There is wickedness and brokenness and sin in here, in our own hearts, in our own bodies, that need to be done away with as well. And that's what Paul, what the Holy Spirit has us focus on in verse 21. We need transformation. And that's what will happen. That's what our Savior will do to our lowly bodies, who will transform our lowly body to be like His glorious body. Lowly is a humble word. It calls attention to, to the weakness and the frailty of our bodies, and, and it emphasizes our, our whole bodies here. We shouldn't just think of our, the, the physical parts of our bodies. And when Paul talks about our bodies here and them being transformed, it includes the whole body, the heart, the mind, the soul. Our whole bodies are tainted with sin, marred by corruption, liable to sickness, suffering, and death. We are prone to wander, prone to leave the God that we love. And so we, we long for Jesus to transform our bodies. And when he will transform our bodies, then they will, he says, be glorious. Glorious because they will be like, verse 21 says, his, Jesus' glorious body. We know from Romans 6 and other places that Jesus, Jesus will never die again. He defeated death by his resurrection, and in so doing, he removed all the power of sin. Well, like him, we too will never die when he returns in glory, because sin will, will no longer cling to our transformed bodies. We will be like him. There will never be, after Jesus comes back, another fall into sin. There will be no more forbidden fruit. There will be no more original sin. There will be no more actual sins either streaming forth like, a, like, a, like water welling up from a woeful source. And because sin will no longer cling to us, well then neither will, will any of its effects of the fall into sin either. All of it will pass away. And what a joy, what gospel hope, this transformation of our lowly, frail, and weak bodies will be. The birth defect that you have, that disability, that new diagnosis, that mental health struggle, that eating disorder, those learning disabilities, those glasses and hearing aids, that brace that you wear, that walker, that wheelchair, your arthritis and back pain, your migraines, your cancer, your Parkinson's and the like. One day, all of these things, all of these things which are part and parcel of this broken and fallen world, they, they will be gone. And, and it will be so not, not, just, not just for us, not just for, for you and I, but for all of those who are in Christ. And think of how, how wonderful that will be for, for all those residents in, in the anchor homes like all those whose minds and bodies have been so profoundly impacted by the fall into sin. What a day, glorious day that will be for them, for us all. 
And it doesn't end there either. When Jesus comes back, all the, the passions of the flesh, all our horizontal selfishness, all those desires to gratify the sinful nature, the lust, the pride, the bitterness, the anger, the addictions that wage war against our souls will be gone. Yes, sin and all of its effects on our bodies will be no more. What a glorious day that will be. All that will be left is eternal, undefiled joy of being with our triune God, of seeing Jesus physically and face to face in body and in soul. Oh, may the Spirit so move our spirits to be as eager as Paul, as eager as the Philippians were, in fact, still are, for the return of Christ. Their bodies have not yet been reunited to their souls. And so let us long with them, let us eagerly cry out together, Come, Lord Jesus, Maranatha. And in the meantime, how can we be anything else but foreigners and strangers here? Tell me, what, what is there? What is there in this sin-ravished and ruined world that we live in that can be possibly better than the glorious transformation that awaits us? There is nothing worth seeking, young people. No earthly wealth or splendor that compares to the treasure and the glorious transformation of bodies when we will be like Christ forever. Verse 21 ends by noting that this transformation will be the, be by the work of Jesus Christ himself, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. It is not surprising. The same one who had power to raise the widow's son and a ruler's daughter, the same one who had the power to call Lazarus up from the grave, the same one who had the power and authority to take his own life up again. Yes, Jesus will be the same one who will also, in his power, raise each one of us up on the last day. At his call, the dead awaken, rise to life from earth and sea. And when Jesus comes as Savior, then, then this place, this world that, that is strange to us, will no longer be strange to us. This world will no longer be plagued with sin and suffering as it is now. It will be rescued, creation. This earth will also be rescued, Romans 8 says, from its bondage to decay. It will be paradise restored. And, and then that means that, that we will no longer be foreigners longing for a heavenly city because the city will come down. Yes, one day heaven will come to earth, you could say. Is that not the picture that we have in Revelation 21? When the holy city, the new Jerusalem, comes down and the voice from the throne of heaven says, Behold, the dwelling of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. Indeed, one day this world will not be strange to us. Because God will be here with us again. Jesus will be with us again. And all sin and its effects will be removed. And so dear Christian, remember who you are. We are not enemies of the cross of Christ whose focus and view is only horizontal. Do not forget the vertical. Remember your passport. Your citizenship is in heaven. This world, despite all of its beauty, is, is a fallen, ruined world, ruined by sin. And so it ought to be strange and foreign to us. We do not belong here, not until Jesus comes back. This is not our home, and this ought to, to move us to eagerly await our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We do so eagerly. Not only because then the enemies of the cross of Christ will be no more, but also because the war that continually wages against ourselves, the sinful nature, the work of the devil, will be no more. And all of our health problems, all of our struggles, all of our tears, all of our grief, that too will also be over. 
over because our bodies will be transformed to be like Christ's glorious body. Sin will be vanquished and death itself will die. Brothers and sisters, let us be faithful. Faithful till that day. Ever waiting for Jesus Christ. Ever praying, ever singing. Come Lord Jesus, Maranatha. Amen.